All right, in this lecture, we're going to begin our discussion of the exterior calculus. And what we've covered so far, of course, is the exterior algebra. And in the exterior algebra, we've learned all about the kth exterior power of, of, of a vector space. Usually, we put the um, dual vector space in, in consideration, but you can do the kth exterior power of any vector space, right? It's uh, just a matter of, of uh, there's nothing special about, about uh, the, there's nothing particularly special about the dual vector space, except that the dual vector space, we use it a lot, and we use the basis of all the one forms of the dual vector space, and we, um, as, uh, as our basis of the uh, vector space we're working with, commonly in general relativity. However, understand this can be done for any vector space, and we produced overall, we produced something called the algebra, and the algebra was this big direct sum, it was a graded algebra, and it's graded because it could be expressed as this direct sum, and um, we learned that the uh, it is an algebra because, of course, everything is a tensor product space, uh, each of these are vector spaces. The direct sum is another vector space, so that gives us our addition operation, it gives us all our inverses and everything else we need for um, a vector space. And it's an algebra because it has this wedge product, and the wedge product is a map from, say, the alpha a, a exterior power um, Cartesian product with the b exterior power. It's a map to the a plus b exterior power, and uh, which is a fancy way of saying I take a uh, uh, an a form on one side and a b form on the other side of the wedge. It's not an intersection, so much a wedge, and I should get um, I, I should get something like delta, which is an element of a plus b, which is an a plus b form. So that was sort of the, that's the algebra. And we learned a bunch of important facts. Most, I guess, some of the important facts we're going to use is omega wedge eta is going to equal minus 1 to the uh, AB eta wedge omega. And, of course, we knew everything was associated. So omega wedge eta wedge delta. doesn't matter really how you associate these things it will always uh, be the same. And so uh, that was the algebra. Oh, I guess we also, I guess to complete the basic idea of what we learned, we learned about how to take something from the kth exterior power and map it to the n minus kth exterior power using the Hodge star operator, which I put on the wrong side for the almost the entire lecture. Right? The Hodge dual of w, the star goes on the left side. I was putting the star on the right side for a lot of the last lecture. I think I caught myself at the end, but but uh, just remember the Hodge dual, so star omega is the Hodge dual of omega. And uh, we learned about that uh, uh, in the presence of a, um, of a metric. And so that was the exterior algebra. And so now we want to talk about the exterior calculus, right? We want to talk about the exterior calculus. And for that, um, we will do it in a very formal, formal way and um, introduce it very factually and slowly over time develop uh, an intuition about how it all is supposed to work. I think that's the best way, actually. Um, there's no hope, I think, starting from the intuition and developing the formalism. I, I think it's best to go the other way. So let's do that. So when we say we're going to create an exterior calculus, we're basically talking about integration and differentiation, right? That's what we're after. We're trying to understand these concepts in the notion of, uh, in the context of our p-forms. Right? We already have a sense of differentiation of arbitrary tensors. We have two types, right? We have the Lie, uh, Lie derivative and the covariant derivative. And um, now we're going to introduce the third type of derivative, which we call the exterior derivative. And what we're after 
is we're after uh, that we're going to de define this. We're going to provide a definition of what this is at for um, for functions that that is for zero forms. I might be I might suppress this part um, after a while. I might suppress the argument. In fact, I'll start suppressing it right now. We're we're interested in taking the um, uh, elements of the zero exterior power and mapping it to the first exterior power using an operation we call d, the exterior derivative. And this operation d we're going to show has all the properties of an object that is very similar to a regular direct derivative. In particular, it's got a property that's very similar to being the uh, product rule or a Leibnizian property. It turns out it's going to be anti-Leibnizian, but that is what we're going to build. And then we're going to prove that there's that in order to satisfy the qualities of being a derivative, there's really only one way to do it. And that's sort of the hallmark on a lot of stuff we've been doing in this course, is we want to see how the math forces us into certain things. But, um, but when we take a function, we're going to create an, a, a concept called the differential of a function, where, say, f is an element of the zeroth exterior power, which, by the way, is just the infinitely differentiable functions on the manifold M, or on the space-time. And this, this notion of the differential of F, this thing is going to be a one-form, right? F is a zero-form, but DF is going to be a one-form. So a one-form eats a vector. So DF should operate on some vector, say V, where V is an element of the vector space, and df is an element of the dual space, right? Because df is a one form, one forms are equal to the dual space. So when the differential of f, which is a one form, gobbles up a vector, any arbitrary vector, we want that answer to be the same as if the vector gobbled up the function. So we build a one form, we're building a one form off of a function, and that one form gobbles vectors in exactly the same way the vector would have gobbled up the original function, right? And this result will always, of course, be a real number. So this is our definition of the how we want an exterior derivative of a function to be. To be. This is what we. Def we're, this is by definition. We're defining it this way, right? We we've defined that. Um, that notion of the of the one form, and uh, it turns out that we can define a one form with a, a little more specificity. I can say it's the partial derivative of f with respect to dxi, dxi, right? By this, this will satisfy this rule, and we can check, right? I can feed this thing. Right? That's a one form. I can feed this thing a vector. Say I fed it x, j, partial j, like that. We're using a coordinate basis all the time now. And um, uh, if uh, when, when we do this, we're going to end up with d, f, i, d, x, i, a, j, d, x, i, partial j, which of course is the delta function ij, which is going to be df i dx i a i. Actually, there's no i under the f. I don't know why I have an i under the f. There's no i there, and there's no i there. Let me fix my f. And this thing is... Uh, that is the same thing you would, which, by the way, equals a i d f d x i, which is a i d i f, right? Which equals v operating on f. This is partial, right? So, so this expression here is specifically chosen to satisfy 
this rule here, which is what we want this thing to mean. So I'm creating a one form that mimics, uh, creating a one form that gobbles up a vector that mimics a vector gobbling up on the function that I use to create this one form. And that form ultimately is this, which I have just shown here. Now, based on the idea that this is the guy I want. This is my core definition that is true in this circumstance. From the zero-width exterior power, I take a function and produce a one-form with this concept. And notice, I, I need these things, right? I need, you know, I know how a vector acts on a function, so I'm kind of, that's something I've already known. It's fully established in my definitions of things. So knowing this, um, there's, you know, this is a very logical thing to produce to say, hey, I want to create... I want to create a, uh, a one form based on a function that mimics this property, right? So that's going to be sort of, there's really not anything else you could do. If you thought very hard about how you might merge these things together, there's, you know, you only have a few operations. You have vectors operating on functions, well, that's one, and you have forms operating on vectors, that's the other. Well, you blend them together, and what do you get? So you get an operation that creates forms from functions. So, Think of that as something that's kind of forced upon us because there's not too many other choices. So now, with that in mind, what it turns out, and this is going that this operator D is more general. It's actually an operator that goes from the pth exterior power to the p plus one exterior power, and whatever this operator is, when p equals zero it had better reduce to that. It had better reduce to that. And in addition to reducing to that, it's going to have two other properties. One is that when D operates on a P form and a, say, Q form, I'm expecting this to be the, the, uh, the operator acting on the P form, let's see, this will be a P form, and this will be a Q form. It'll operate on the P form, wedge the Q form, and then it's going to have this factor, um, this, the P value, the P value of the P form, times the P form wedge the differential of the Q form. Right? So that is going to be the anti-Leibnizian uh, property. And it's anti-Leibnizian because if this was a regular derivative, it would be the derivative of omega wedge eta plus omega wedge, or the derivative of eta wedge omega. The problem is, is you've got to commute these guys, right? And so ultimately we're going to show that that comm commutation, oops, there should be a plus sign here, that commutation uh, gives rise to this. We're going to show how that works out um, in a minute. But uh, it turns out you can't just willy-nilly commute these things. Sometimes they commute, sometimes they anti-commute. And that d d the distinction of when they commute and anti-commute is based on this number, on, on omega, the leading one of these two terms, just the p-form. The, uh, the size of the q-form doesn't matter. It's just the p-form. So... Um, then also the other important thing is is really kind of an amazing one. It's d omega. Oops, sorry, screwed up my amazing one. If you take the exterior derivative of the exterior derivative of something, you'll always get zero. You do this thing twice and you get zero. Sometimes it's written d squared equals zero, and that's really interesting. And uh, uh, anti-symmetry really changes things a lot. Um, if you studied physics, uh, fermions and bosons, right, the properties of those two things are all based on the symmetry of their wave functions, and they have totally different physical properties. And that anti-symmetry of fermions makes a huge difference as to how they behave. And likewise, just in elementary mathematics, once you demand things be anti-symmetric, you start getting a lot of weird stuff like this, where the second derivative of something is always going to be zero. Anyway, so the point is, is that if we want an operation that behaves this way, right, and reduces to this, it turns out that it's unique, 
right? There's only one operation D that does this, and it does exist, right? So, you, you know, if we define, we say we want something that behaves this way, this way, and reduces to this, I have to prove that such a thing exists. And then once I prove it exists, I have to prove that there's only one of them, right? And if I can do that, then it's kind of forced on us uh, based on these choices. So let's see if, uh, let's see if we can convince ourselves that this such a thing exists and such a thing is unique. Okay, I'm going to begin by showing that the exterior derivative is unique. And what I mean by this is that this object D, which we have defined with specific properties, which I better just rewrite because we're going to have to get them well memorized. Uh, let me put the little bar here, F D X I. That's the definition of the exterior derivative of a zero form. So that's definition of D for the zeroth exterior power. And, and d omega wedge eta is d omega wedge eta plus the anti-commutative uh, part of p of omega wedge d eta. And this gives us a recursive ability to then find the exterior derivative of anything because omega and eta are this, presumably let's say this is a p form and this is a q form um, you can always make a p form as a sum of one forms and this will allow us to slowly peel back and and uh, recursively discover how to um, take the exterior derivative of any of any uh, p form or q form but this is a rule that we are presuming that we are presuming uh, uh, is obeyed by the exterior derivative, this anti-Leibnizian rule. And the other rule that we're presuming exists, which is motivated by a deep notion of geometry that, again, I pointed out, to capture its intuition is, it's actually a topological, it's, it's actually topology, which this is talking about, right? Uh, ultimately, this has to do with the fact that the, I'll just write it down, the boundary of a boundary equals zero boundary. There, there is no boundary of a boundary, right? So if you have a, a disk, the boundary of the disk is a circle, but the circle has no boundary, right? Ultimately, that has a lot to do with what I just, with, with what we wrote down for um, that second rule. But again, that's something it's worth figuring out after we understand the definition. So right now we're going to take it as just a defined quantity, as a defined property that has to occur. Plus everything's linear, right? So the question is, is if we can find a D that does this, right? We don't know if it exists or not. We're going to wait on that. But if it does exist, is it unique? And by unique, we mean D omega is fully specified I, that once I find the D, I can always write down D omega if I know what that D is. And I'll never get a different answer. There'll be no flexibility in the result. So that's what uh, I think it's worth proving. Um, I think it's worth proving that this is unique. So the uniqueness proof for this is um, starts out with uh, looking at the basis vector of P forms. So let's consider P forms. Right? The basis vector for p forms is very conveniently written in the following way. Uh, let me clear that last one up a bit. So i of 1 is less than i of 2 dot 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 which is less than i of p. So what we're doing is we're creating a series of ascending indices and the basis vector is always going to be those ascending indices on on uh, uh, each of the basis one forms. And so that means we can have something like dx0 wedge dx2 wedge dx3 wedge dx7 right if 
we were using a dimension 7 vector space or dual vector space if the if the dimensionality of that was say 7 and we were considering 1 2 3 4 the fourth exterior power right so but i could not have dx3 wedge dx2 wedge d x uh, 4 wedge d x 7 because the 3 and the 2 are not ascending what I would have to do is if I mean this this is a is linearly dependent on d x 2 wedge d x 3 wedge d x 4 wedge d x 7 but um, we're going to make we're going to write down uh, the basis vectors just in terms of the ascending indices and so it's very common to do it this way, where we presume that there's some ascending pattern of indices that we basically give by the function i, and i just takes integer arguments and just makes sure that there's this ascending rule in there. Very common in many textbooks that study, that cover this stuff. So it's important to kind of get used to that notation. In fact, um, that notation is so common, but it is bulky. So there is a tendency to even simplify that further by making the capital letter I sort of equal this list of indices. So I would be uh, essentially I, well, I is sort of this list, but it's I1, I2, I, well, 3, I, P. And then we might write... Um, the one form omega is omega sub i, which is a function of space time, right? But I'll suppress that. dx i, and then you just sort of plug in this multi index here. This i is called a multi index, right? When, when you, and when you, I presume you're studying along in some other book of your choice, and you may very well see these multi indexes um, being used. And, um, and I've even seen it this way. I've seen it omega i, where they just put the multi-index on the component, but then they leave this like this. So they don't put the multi-index here because they kind of want to talk a lot about the structure of the basis vector, but of the basis form. And, and they're, they're, this is just sort of hanging on for whatever exposition they're doing. We might actually do that in, uh, in this proof or the next proof. But, uh, but right now, for the proof of uniqueness, I want to talk about um, uh, I want to talk about this guy here, just this basis vector. And what I want to show is I want to show that the exterior derivative of, well, the exterior derivative of this thing equals zero. And notice that that's not the same thing as this. Whoops, I didn't even finish that, did I? That has to equal zero, right? This, this says the exterior derivative of something that's known of a form that is known to be the exterior derivative of another form. This is a form, right? In fact, if omega is if omega is a p form, if omega is an element of the pth exterior power, this is an element of the p plus one th exterior power. So um, this is saying that if I take the exterior derivative of something that is the exterior derivative of a form, I get zero. That's not what this is. This guy inside, it's the wedge product of a bunch of one forms, and each of these one forms are in fact exterior derivatives because, because x i of one, right, that's an element of the zeroth exterior power, which is simply, uh, well, I should put an element there, which is uh, which is the c infinity functions on the space time. It is the coordinate function, right? It's a coordinate function. So if I take a point in space time, this function i of that point just returns the value of 
that space-time point, the i-th coordinate of the space-time point. So it would return, say, x0 if i of 1 equaled 0. So this is a function, is my point. So the exterior derivative of, of a function, well, we know what that is based on this definition up here, right? So that's going to be dx i of 1 is the partial derivative of i of x i of 1 times d x i, like that. I, I should, shouldn't use i. Let me use j, x j. And that's going to equal the partial derivative of x i 1 with x j d x j. But this partial derivative, by its very nature, this partial derivative is going to be the delta function of i1 and j. So this whole thing is going to end up being dx i1, right? So I've proven that dx i1 equals dx i1, but that goes to show that this definition works perfectly fine for coordinate functions. So the point is, is each of these coordinate functions is in fact um, a, a exterior derivative of e each of these uh, coordinate basis uh, uh, one forms, these basis one forms, these basis vectors of the covector space are in fact exterior derivatives of of zero forms. So they satisfy this. So, f so the point being, if I take the exterior derivative of dx i, of any i, I will get a zero. Right? So I know that this is true. But that doesn't mean, that does not mean that the exterior derivative of this wedge product is going to be zero because we don't know if this wedge product is actually the exterior derivative of any form, right? We don't know that. There's actually some words for this, by the way. Um, if, if, uh, th this, this, this concept is important enough that there are some words. If phi is a form, and it's equal to the exterior derivative of some other form, right? And so phi would, of course, be a p plus 1 form, and omega would be a p form. Then if that's the case, it's called exact, meaning uh, phi is exact. That's the language. If d phi equals 0, then phi is called closed, and that's unrelated to the word closed used in topology, by the way. But it's closed if d phi equals 0. So the good news is that an ex any exact function is closed, right? Because if phi is exact, then d phi is going to be d of d omega, which is 0. And it's therefore, any exact function is closed. It is not necessarily true that any closed function is exact, however. Um, but the, anyway, those, the point is, uh, I should have probably mentioned those words in the last lecture. They're, they're important, especially when we start talking about the differential equations and how all of this means, what, what all this means regarding differential equations. Anyway, uh, let's see, we talked about the multi-index, talked about the functions here. Uh, I'm working on the uniqueness proof, but the reason these proofs are nice is because it goes through all of these little facts the notations and everything. So I, I, along the way to show the uniqueness, um, I want to show that this thing equals zero. So the way this is done is by induction. And we've actually already started the induction because for p equals 1, I've already shown that it's true, right? I've just proven that it's true for p equals 1. So that's good. So for induction, now I, I assume it's true for p equals n minus 1. So I'm going to now assume that d of d x i 2 wedge dot 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 wedge d x i uh, well let me see, let me, let me put that, let me make that a 1 and then d x i n minus 1. So I'm going to assume that if I have 
n minus 1, 1 forms, all wedged together, and I take the exterior derivative, I get a 0, right? I assume that that's true, because this is an induction proof, right? So once I've shown that it's true for the, the p equals 1 case, I assume it's true for the p equals n minus 1 case, and then I prove that, given that assumption, that it's true for p equals n, given this assumption, and given this demonstration, then I can assume it's true for all n. So I assume that that's equal to zero, and now I'm going to, um, uh, now I have to prove it's true for p equals n. The way I'm going to do that is I'm going to study this object. I'm going to study the exterior derivative of xi1, the function xi1, the zero form xi1, the guy I talked about when I, when we proved this, wedged with dxi2, wedged dot 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 dxi, um, uh, dxi n. Right. So I'm going to look at this guy. Now notice this is a a function, a zero form, wedged with a one form, wedged with a one form, wedged with a one form, all the way down to the end where it's wedged with its final one form. So, and and you can do that. Now remember, uh, a function f wedged with some form omega, say that's a p form, where p is greater than zero, that just equals f times the p form. When you're dealing with a zero form in the uh, in the wedge sequence, that zero form just gets is a multiplication, straight multiplication. But you still can th you can still wedge it because it's still a zero form plus a one form is a one form, and that's what this is. This is just a one form. So this wedge product is still totally legit, uh, even though this is a function, right? It's still okay to have that wedge product there. That was very confusing for a long time for me uh, when I was learning this. I was like, how are you wedging a function in there? I finally realized, of course, that a function is a zero form, so it can be wedged just like anything else. Um, so uh, once you've got this, now we write down, now we split this thing up based on this rule here. We're going to split this guy up so that omega is just the zero form, and eta is everything else. So with using that rubric, this becomes, following this rule, right, I need d omega, well that's just d of this function, and we know what that is, that's dxi1, and then I wedge it with eta, but eta is the rest of this stuff, right, that's a form, Right? Eight is a form. That's a form. So I wedge it with dxi2 dot 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 wedge dxi n, like that. So that's the first part. Then the second part is plus minus 1 to the p. p refers to the um, exterior power that uh, uh, houses the first of the two forms in this wedge product, which is omega, but we know that that's a function, which means it's housed in the zeroth exterior power, so it's minus one to the zero, and then it's just the function itself, i1, and then that's wedged with d of dxi2 dot 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 wedge dxi n. All right, so uh, so what have we got here? This this is uh, a basis vector for the nth exterior power, and this guy is a basis vector for the nth minus oneth exterior power, but it's the exterior derivative of that basis vector. But remember. I, I assumed that the exterior derivative of the n minus one -th basis uh, form was zero. So I've assumed that this here is zero. So this whole part goes away. And now I can write the very important statement that d of... Um, <clears throat> 
d of x i1 wedge d x i2 wedge dot 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 wedge d x i n right that equals that equals um, d x i1 wedge d x i2 dot 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 wedge d x i n so what I've shown here is that the exterior derivative of this thing, which is the an n minus one uh, uh, form basis vector wedged on the right side of a zero form coordinate function, just equals this thing here, which is the n base the va basis vector for the nth exterior power. So I've I've shown that. But what's important is the left-hand side, the left-hand side, this is the exterior derivative of a form, right? It's the exterior derivative of a form. So if I take the exterior derivative of the left-hand side, it's going to be zero, guaranteed by our assumptions, our rules, our, our, our stipulations on how the exterior power should work. So when I do this, when I do d of this, right, I get zero. But if I, what I do the left-hand side, I have to do the right-hand side. So likewise, if I do, do d of this, that's going to be zero also. So I have now, now let's review what we've done. What we did is we started by assuming the properties of d, right? And we were interested in proving that the um, uh, exterior derivative of the basis vector of uh, the pth exterior power is going to be zero. What I did is I proved that that was true for the case of the first exterior power, when p equals one. I assumed it was true for the n minus one exterior power. And then I demonstrated that based on those properties, this demonstration and this assumption, I was able to prove that it's true for the p equals n power, given those things I just listed. And that is a complete inductive proof. So now I know that the exterior derivative, oops, the exterior derivative of any basis vector of any pth exterior power is going to be zero. So now we're going to use that fact to prove the uniqueness. It's kind of a little heavy-handed uh, way to go. I mean, you can actually, if you just sort of work this recursively, Right, where in here you put this guy, and then you kind of work, you, you, you break it up and in the beginning every time, and you split it up, and you split it up using this rule over and over and over again. You can see why this is going to be zero, right? But uh, that's not good enough for mathematicians. They, it's been a long time since I've done an induction proof anyway, so I kind of, kind of got the, the rust out from the induction proof. Anyway, so now with that... Um, with that proof in hand, uh, what do we do next? Well, next I'm going to write down a general one form, which I could write down this way. Um, the sum over all multi-indices that follow that rule of ascending indices um, of omega sub i, the component, and then I'm going to actually put in the full basis vector here. So it'll be dx I1, I'm going to write down the full multi-index, dx i2, dot dot dot, del dx i p, like that. So remember, this, this is really, this i is i1, i2, i3, i p, but I'm putting it as an i and I'm summing over all the i's because it's a little convenient, otherwise I would have this long string, I'd have to, I'd have to literally write I1, I2, dot, 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 I, P here, and it just becomes a little unwieldy. So we very typically use that I, like I think I mentioned on the last slide. Okay, so that is our general, general uh, P form. This is a P form, right? So it's a member of the pth exterior power. 
So this general p form, um, well, I want to know what is d omega. Can I completely specify d omega so there's no room for anything uh, based on the previous rules that are based on the rules that define d, d? So d omega is going to be d of this thing here, right? So because it is all linear, I can take the d into the sum, and I will get, um, I will get what? I'll get, well, let's see. So, uh, well, so we, br we break this thing up with a wedge right here in the middle, right? We put a little wedge there, and that's how we're going to break this up. So we have the first part of the form and the second part of the form. So the rule, so I better write it out. So I'm going to go d times omega i wedge dx i1 dot 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 dx i p, right? And this wedge is just that, this wedge here is just that multiplication of the, of the uh, zero form with this whole darn thing. So that guy is going to be d omega i, remember omega i is a function, Omega i, this is always a function on space-time, so that's an element of the zeroth exterior power, right, which equals the C infinity function, right? So d omega i wedge dx i 1 dot 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 dx i p, and then it's going to be plus the antiderivative part, which is going to be the zero again, of omega i wedge d x i 1 oops d of d x i 1 wedge d x i 2 dot 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 wedge d x i p okay but we've just shown on the whole previous last slide that was the whole point of this was that was that uh, that this thing is always zero, right? The exterior derivative of any of these basis vectors is always going to be zero. So with that in mind, this whole side, that goes to zero. So now, what have I got? I've got uh, d omega equals this, right? Because all this is zero. So, well, but the good news is I have a rule that allows me to solve for this, right? Because I'm looking at the, I'm looking at you right here, right? I know what I know what all these are. These are the one forms associated with the coordinate basis functions. That's easy. This guy is a little bit a little bit hinky, but actually it's not hinky at all because we have our assumption about how that works, our stipulation about what is the exterior derivative of a zero form. And this is all kind of recursive, right? So if we can get to the bottom of the recursion, that's where the zero forms are. So this thing is going to be the sum over all the possible multi-indices that obey that ascending rule of, of the partial derivative of omega i with respect to dx i 1 dx, well, uh, actually, not even I1. Let me just, with respect to, say, j, dxj, right? That's a sum. Let me let me actually write it as a, as a full sum instead of, so let me go 0, dx0, plus partial derivative i, dx1, dx1, dot, 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 partial derivative w, i, dx. Now, have I stipulated anywhere what the dimensionality of the underlying vector space was? Because there's going to be one of these for every um, for every dimension in the underlying vector space. Because this is p, the p form could be anything from, remember, it can go from lambda 0 to lambda, to, it can go from the 0th exterior power to the nth exterior power, where the dimension of the underlying vector space equals n. P can be anywhere in between these two numbers. But 
when we bust it out like this, you're going to get one, you're going to get n of these, right? So let's, but I've, I used n in the previous proof, so let's say the dimensionality of the underlying vector space is um, m. So this is going to go to m, right? So that is what this thing is, right? Let me erase this here. And d omega i actually equals this by our stipulations, right? And then that gets wedged with dx i 1, wedge dx i 2, wedge dx i p. Okay, so that is what d omega is. Um, all right. So, is there any room for guesswork? Is there any variables or anything missing? This is perfectly defined. If I know this function, I know that derivative. I know what that is. That's perfectly defined. Uh, once we have the coordinate system, that's perfectly defined. This entire thing is perfectly defined. That entire thing is perfectly defined. So, based on the fact, you know, we eliminated this, um, we followed all the rules, and we used every rule, right? We used this rule, we used this rule, and we used this rule. So we used the three rules. We had to stipulate, we proved that it was true for zero. We had this induction proof that gave us uh, this fact here. And once we did that, we took a, the most general possible, the most general possible P form and we were able to absolutely and unambiguously write down what d omega is. That means it's unique. That is the proof of uniqueness. Okay, so if, if it exists, then it's unique, right? If it exists. So let's see, what can we do about existence? All right, so now to show existence, let's talk about showing existence. Well, the first thing we should notice is if you look at this, we actually have a prescription of how to take the exterior derivative of any p form. This is the formula, right? This is the formula. You you take this p form, take this take the components create this new one form out of the components, right? This is a one form, right? It's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's built out of the basis vectors of one forms. Oops, I, I forgot the d, x, i, n right there, right? Actually, let me, d, x, i, uh, uh, oh, no, no, not i, n, right? Sorry, d, x, n. Right, that belongs right in there. Anyway, um, this is a one form. So you create the one form associated with the uh, uh, component, and you wedge it into what's left of well the the basic basis vector. And you'll notice that ups the formness by one. Right, this is a p form. This is a one form. So this is a this whole thing is a p plus one form, which is exactly what we expect d omega to be. So this sort of, so if I want to say it exists, this is how to figure it out. This is one of them. So now the question is, um, we've, we, we used it to show uniqueness. Now I have to prove that, well, let's take this guy. Let's take this prescription and see if it satisfies this rule and this rule. Right, this is true always, right? This is true by stipulation. In fact, we could actually test the first rule, I, I suppose. We could look at this. Say I put a function here, right? Well, then this goes away, and all that's left is this, which is, of course, exactly what this says, right? So we know that this prescription here actually satisfies the first of our stipulations. Now the question is, is, does it satisfy this stipulation and does it satisfy this stipulation? And we can actually show that it, it does. So I'm going to consider, um, uh, so let's check this one. Let's check, let's check first d omega wedge uh, 
eta, right? Let's let's see how that works out. And for omega, I'm going to use just one function, I'll call it g, and it will be a p-form. So it's dx, why am I d so lame? dxi1 dot 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 wedge wedge dxip. So it's a p-form. And eta will be a q-form and typically the proofs and you can see this proof all over the place, by the way. This is, there's certainly nothing unusual about this proof. Eta will have H, D, X, I, 1, wedge, dot, 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 wedge, D, X, I, Q. All right, so it's a Q form. And so now, um, now notice that this, in this case, I'm not summing over anything. I'm just doing it for one basis vector piece, meaning this was, I, I, I do one multi-index here, one set of ascending, P ascending indices, and we'll, we'll, just, we'll just assert that the dimensionality of the underlying vector space, right, we'll call that N. So and all we know is that N is greater than or equal to P. Right, but we take whatever set of multi indices we only we're only going to take one of them, and the reason is is because this whole thing is linear, right? So omega is actually the sum, right? With this, what I would have a multi index normally on G that sums into this. In fact, I, it would be very typical to write G multi index I D X multi index I like that, and that of course uh, is, is an implied sum over all the multi-indices, g, i, d, x, i, and uh, each term, you know, every possible combination of increasing indices would be represented in that sum. But you just stick that in here because we do know that the exterior derivative is linear in all these things. I only need to show um, that, that, uh, that this, I only need to show that this is true here for just one term uh, or, or, or four forms with only one term and then you extend by linearity to the rest of the terms, all right? So uh, given that uh, understanding, we are going to pick omega and eta to be these particularly simple forms. Um, I've got to get rid of this guy here now, right? Shoot, sorry, X and G. So, all right, so let's just hash through it, right? D of G, D, X, wedge, wedge, D, X, I, P, wedge, H, D, X, I, Uh, 1 wedge d x i q now i guess i guess it's uh uh i this this multi index here this sequence of i 1 through i n it's not the same as this one so i really should rename this to j right i should call this sequence j so this is j 1 to j q it's not n, that's p. So, so there's two different multi-indices here, right? Um, I should make that true here too, j and j, right? So uh, I'm going to take the exterior derivative of all of that, right? And remember, these guys here, these g's, they're, that's just a function. So um, uh, this is ultimately going to be the exterior derivative of g h, right? And g h d x i 1 wedge d x i p wedge d x j 1 wedge d x j cubed.
like that. And now we just apply the basic um, the basic rule that we already know for this kind of object. Well, the the assumed rule, right? This guy. We are essentially going to apply this rule right here, and we're going to split. We're going to split everybody right here, and this would be the omega, and what's left would be the eta. Um, uh, we're, I mean, we're going to apply that other rule. I mean, I guess we've already used defined omega and eta here, so uh, I want to apply this rule where this part is just the constant function and this part is everything else, all right? So I guess I probably shouldn't write omega and eta that way. So this is going to then be d of the function gh, Right? It's going to be that thing. Uh, it's going to be that thing wedged with dxi1 dot 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 dxjq, where that's this whole part here is sort of summed up in that little thing right there. So, well, what is what is the the uh, exterior derivative of a function. Well, that's part of our definition. We know what that is. It's going to be the partial derivative of gh dx0 dx0 oops, plus the partial derivative of gh dx1 dx1 dot 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 partial derivative of gh dxn dxn like that with wedged into, so that's now a one form, right? That's a one form, because that's, again, can't point it out enough. That's a zero form. That's going to make it into a one form, and the prescription is by our stipulation up here. So we wedge that into dxi1, dot, 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 wedge dxjq, right? So, now, um, what next? Well, these partial derivatives uh, can be split. So the partial derivatives, these are regular partial derivatives. So this is going to be dg dx0 times h dx0 plus um, g dh dx0 dx0, like that. So each of these partial derivatives is going to split into these two parts based on the product rule. It's just the simple product rule, right? And what that's going to do is it's going to have the effect of doubling everything here up, where you get this term and that term sort of work, working out separately. Um, so it will end up being... Uh, Let's see, partial derivative g d. Uh, let's, let's, let's sum it up now. Let's make it a, a sum. dx k uh, h dx k like that, and then that's going to be wet. So this is this is the full sum. We're doing the Einstein sum here, right? I'll just make sure, because I, I don't want you to wonder where all these additions went. They, I wrapped them back up into a sum, right? And this is dxi1 dot 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 dxjq, like that, all right? And um, that will be then plus partial h d x h i j k how about l g d x l wedge d x i one dot 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 wedge d x i q or j q so now i've i've split this up into uh, i've taken this whole thing 
right, this big form. I compress this using the Einstein summation convention, but then split it into two parts based on the product rule. So let's take a look at the first term. This first term, I wonder if I have room, if I um, take this H and I'm going to move the H into the front of where these J's start, which you can't see here because I kind of suppressed that. So I'm going to write this as partial derivative of G, partial derivative of HK, DXK, like that, right? And I'm going to wedge that with DXI1, wedge dot dot dot, DXI, P, and then I'm going to move the H into the place here, wedge H, and then I'm going to put in the rest of the J's, D, X, I, G, uh, D, oh, sorry, uh, D, X, J, 1, wedge, dot, 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 D, X, J, Q. And what's important to see is that this is eta, and this is d omega, and it's d omega by our discovery here, by our choice, that this is how we're defining d omega to function, right? So we're, we claim that it exists, and this is it, so we're checking. And so this is d omega, and this is eta which actually is good. We're making progress because that, um, oh, I didn't, write, I didn't rewrite the rule, but that is uh, the first part of the rule. D omega eta is D omega wedge eta. So that's good. So now, um, what about this term? So let's, let's look at that term. Well, that term, let's see if I have room to write it down, that term is going to be, uh, well, let's just look at this one part, g times dxi1 wedge dot 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 wedge dxi um, p, right? Let me move this so I can work it a little bit better. I'm going to move it here. And then I have this piece. I have dh dxl d, uh, del xl dxl, which is a one form. And that's sitting in the front. Oops. That's sitting in the front of this mess. But I want to move that one form in front of all of the DJs. I want to move it. So normally I would have I would have wedge DXJ1 wedge DXJ2 wedge DXJQ. I want to move this to this spot right here. And that, if I do it, will be d eta. But now this is a one form. So every time, so it's starting here, every time I exchange it with one of these one forms, I'm going to pick up a minus sign. So the number of minus signs is going to be p. So I'm go in order to put that there, I have to put a minus 1 to the p here, right? And then this term, uh, so if I slip that in here, then this term is going to be um, plus minus 1 to the p. This guy is omega, and then this guy, oops, this guy is ah, at the bottom of my screen here. This guy is wedge d eta. Phew. Okay, so what I've proven now 
is, in fact, um, if you use if you use this rule here, and you just do a straightforward, and, and and you come up with very general vectors or pieces of vectors, and you do a very straightforward application of of um, of just plugging them in into this, just literally plugging it in. That's all I did, right? I took this, plugged it in, took that, plugged it in. Then I did very basic operations. I pulled out the two functions. I used um, the uh, standard rule for taking the um, uh, uh, taking the uh, differential uh, the, or the exterior derivative of this thing, and I just then used ordinary calculus, and then I finally got something in the end, which is an, which was an exact match. Right, this here is this here was the first part was d omega wedge d eta and the second part was oops it was not that it was d omega wedge eta and then the second part was minus 1 to the p shit sorry minus 1 to the p omega wedge d eta and therefore i know that this prescription here satisfies this rule here. Right? So now all that's left to check is does that prescription satisfy this rule? And that's not too hard to show either. And we would use the, basically the same principle. We're going to start with omega. We're going to just use 1 and we'll use these multi-indices again. dxi 1 wedge dot 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 wedge dx i p like that we write down d omega which is really easy now we're very good with this we just write partial derivative of g dx I'll say uh, k uh, dx k like that wedged into dx i 1 wedge dot 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 wedge d x i p that's d omega and now I'm going to take another d of this right d of d omega and that's going to be well this is just going to be d of the thing above right this whole thing I just put in here and it's d of that well it's actually not very difficult to see that this is going to now be, uh, I'll use the summation convention. I'm actually going to break out the summation convention, right? And I'm going to show that it's, it's a double sum, right? It's a double sum over, uh, let's say, k is the interior sum and l is the second sum. And it's going to be the second partial derivative of g and the first sum, the first derivative was with k, dx, k, and the second one is dx, l, like that. And then it's, um, uh, dx, l, wedge, dx, k, wedge, dx, uh, i of 1, dot, 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 wedge d x i of p right so so that because uh, the first exterior derivative added this one form in here so now I have a p plus one form and remember that's a sum but uh, so I mean it's really the sum of k terms right or, or the sum of uh, whatever the dimensionality of the underlying vector space terms of this but it's nice and convenient to keep it this way. But then we're doing it again. So we're taking the derivative of this. This now becomes the function, and this now becomes the sort of the basis vector, um, even though it's actually a bunch of basis vectors. And we take the second derivative, and then we have to add another one form in there. And so we're now at p plus 2. 
right? But that's all right, because we are doing a second derivative, so we're supposed to be a p plus 2. So, but now with it, this sum is over all these, um, it's, it's over all of these variables here, but if we try to, we can actually bunch this all together, because we know that that these things are all related by a minus sign. If if um, uh, if if we wanted to all if we wanted this to always be uh, um, multi indices, right, ascending indices, we would sum over all the l's and all the k's. But when l and k are swapped, we just get a minus sign here, right? So I can actually turn this into a single sum, right? I can turn it into a single sum where I stipulate that. Um, uh, k is less than L, right? And if I did that, then I eliminate half of the possibilities, right? Because, well, not, not half, right? Because with k equals L, you're on... So this is k and this is L. When k equals L, um, the term in the sum is zero, right? When, if k equals L, you get dL dl, and this thing is zero. So we don't have to worry about k equaling l. If k is uh, less than l, then we're, we're uh, floating around in here, uh, in this lower triangle. But when k is, but when, uh, no, I'm sorry, when k is less than l, when k is less than l, we're floating around in here. The point is, is that when you're floating around the other side of the square, you're just the opposite sign, right? So you can actually write this as d squared g partial x l partial x k minus d squared g partial x k partial x l, like that, and, um, whoops, and then this becomes dx l wedge dx k wedge dx i one dot 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 wedge dx i p like that. And um, so what we what I've done is I've basically taken uh, uh, two terms of the sum and combined it into one term and then summed over half of the number of things. And you can do this only because you know that when k and l switch, the only thing that switches is a sign. But what also switches is this nature of the partial derivative. It's partial derivative of k first and then l second and l first and k second. But these are regular C infinity functions, right? These are just C infinity functions. And we know that the partial derivatives of those things, the order doesn't matter. So we know that every single time this term is going to be zero, and therefore the entire thing must equal zero, proving that this guy equals zero. So with that, we're actually kind of done with our formal introduction of the exterior derivative, because what we've done is we have shown that if we go all the way back to the beginning and we talk about what we want uh, the ele most elementary piece of the exterior der derivative to be. That's this thing. That means when you have a function, the exterior derivative of that function acting on a vector, the, we, want, we want to take a function, convert it to a one form, one form z vectors, the only number in sight is the vector acting on the original function. So we use this to stipulate this, and then we said, okay, we also want to stipulate these things here, right? This, it's got to be an antiderivation, which is what this rule is, and it's got to have this property as well. And once we decided that that was what we wanted, we were able to show that if we can find a D that does that at all, it's going to be unique. And we proved that it will be unique and it will have this way of calculating D omega for um, uh, any general, any general, uh, p form. And then once we showed that we had a method of doing the calculation, we actually proved that that method actually satisfied the original uh, stipulation about um, the differential form of the wedge product of two arbitrary forms. 
and we were able to prove that um, the second exterior derivative of any form is going to be zero. And therefore, therefore, um, this guy, we, I guess in some sense we proved the existence by showing one. We found a method, and we checked that the method worked, therefore we proved it exists, and we had already figured out that it was the, the method of the uniqueness proof found, not only did it prove that it was unique, it also found the object. But we just had to, what, all that remained was to show that that object satisfied the rules, right? Like satisfied this, this rule and satisfied um, uh, this rule here, right? So that's the exterior derivative's formal introduction. Now there's a lot more to talk about with the exterior derivative, and we're going to do a few lessons on it. But um, let's just uh, end this one here, and uh, we'll do some examples, and we'll, uh, uh, we'll apply it to electromagnetism in the next lecture.